chapter four introduces us to enzymes, metabolism, and cellular respiration. Uh, let's start out with a discussion on enzymes. The first concept you need to understand in this section is the idea of activation energy. For any chemical reaction to occur in your body, uh, a certain level of energy has to be reached first. This energy is called the activation energy, and it serves as a very important barrier uh, for chemical reactions. Without it, without the activation energy, um, every chemical in your body would be reacting all the time with everything, and it would be very difficult to regulate your metabolism. The activation energy keeps molecules quiet uh, until they're needed. When the time comes for a necessary reaction to take place, uh, a specific type of protein called an enzyme steps in and helps the reaction along by reducing the activation energy necessary for it to occur. Different enzymes regulate all the different metabolic processes in your body. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to live. So how exactly do enzymes work? Well, uh, each enzyme has an active site where a substrate can bind. The substrate is whatever molecule or compound the enzyme is acting upon. When the substrate binds to the enzyme, the enzyme modifies its shape slightly to fit tighter to the substrate. Uh, this, this modification that where it fits tighter, that's called the induced fit model. Um, when this occurs, the enzyme puts stress on the substrate's chemical bonds, and that makes it easier for them to be modified or broken. The chemical reaction occurs, and the products are released. Uh, the enzyme is not irreversibly altered, uh, nor is it used up in this process, so it can go on to do its job pretty much indefinitely. Uh, in general, increasing the temperature will also speed up the reaction, um, but at a certain point, the higher the heat is, it'll actually cook uh, or denature the enzyme and it will no longer work. Also in this chapter is a discussion of cellular respiration. This is a rather complicated process and it's easy to get lost in the details. So before you begin studying it in earnest, make sure you understand the big picture concepts. Cellular respiration is the process that your cells use to convert glucose into ATP, which is a usable form of energy. It takes place primarily in the mitochondria, and it requires oxygen to run to its full completion. Uh, in fact, this is the entire reason that you breathe, is to take in oxygen for the process of cellular respiration and get rid of carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of cellular respiration. Here's the general equation for cellular respiration. Glucose, which is C6H12O6, uh, plus oxygen, O2, yields energy in the form of ATP and carbon dioxide, or CO2, and water, H2O, as waste products. Uh, you should recognize either of these two equations, either the written one or the chemical equation, uh, as the process of cellular respiration. Just a note on the importance of cellular respiration, uh, cyanide poisoning actually inhibits an enzyme in the mitochondria that's necessary for cellular respiration. If you get a big enough dose of cyanide, you die within a matter of minutes. Um, that is how important this process is to your body. If you don't have ATP, you die. Since the majority of this process takes place in the mitochondria, let's review that organelle. Um, when it's an individual organelle, it's called the mitochondrion, uh, mitochondrion, and then when it's more than one, the plural form of that is mitochondria, but you'll kind of hear me use that almost interchangeably. So the mitochondria have two phospholipid bilayer membranes. The outer membrane surrounds the organelle, and the inner membrane is folded, uh, and these folds are termed cristae. Uh, the matrix is a semi-fluid material, kind of think of like gelatin or something along those lines, uh, that fills the inner space. So part of the process of cellular respiration will take place inside the matrix, and part takes place on the cristae, on the inner membrane folds. The purpose of cellular respiration is to make energy in the form of ATP. So what is ATP? Well, ATP is made up of three phosphate groups uh, that are attached to a ribose sugar and an adenine base. Um, remember adenine from the discussion on DNA? Okay, it's the same molecule. It's that two-ringed base, adenine. The reason that ATP is so very useful to the cell is because a lot of energy is stored in those bonds between the phosphate groups. When water is added to ATP 
and the bond is broken between the last two phosphate groups, energy is released. Uh, the cell will use that released energy to power many different processes. The phosphate group that was released can be transferred to another molecule during this process, and if that happens, that's called phosphorylation. Uh, for example, if an enzyme needs energy to perform its job, the phosphate group could be transferred from ATP to that enzyme, and then the enzyme could undergo a change in shape that would allow it to perform its job. Cellular respiration occurs in three stages. Stage one is glycolysis. Stage two is the citric acid cycle. And stage three is the electron transport chain. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, and it does not require oxygen. It's actually the only part of cellular respiration that does not require oxygen. The citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, and it does require oxygen. And the electron transport chain, or ETC, uh, occurs in the mitochondrial cristae, so on that membrane, and it also requires oxygen. Um, this is the money step. This is the step that makes the most ATP. So before you go any further uh, in the study of this topic, make sure you understand the overall purpose of cellular respiration, including the formulas. Um, make sure you can recall the three stages, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport chain, uh, where they occur in the cell, and whether or not they require oxygen. I'll actually have a separate video talking through these stages in a little bit more detail, but before you get to that, you need to make sure you've got a good foundation of the basics. Um, otherwise, you're going to get lost in the details. So get the basics first and then kind of go into the details. For cellular respiration to run its full course, oxygen is required. I've mentioned that before. Um, however, in some situations, such as muscle cells that are undergoing really intense exercise, uh, the cell can actually run out of oxygen. So if that happens, if the cell runs out of oxygen, um, it can perform an alternative type of respiration called anaerobic respiration. And those two terms, you're going to see them pop up uh, again and again. So aerobic and aerobic. Uh, these are opposites. Aerobic means that you do need oxygen. Oxygen is required. And anaerobic means oxygen is not required. And it may actually be detrimental, as in the case of anaerobic bacteria um, that die in the presence of oxygen. So make sure you know those terms. Aerobic, anaerobic. Anaerobic respiration is basically the first part of normal cellular respiration, so it's glycolysis, and that does make a small amount of ATP. However, part of glycolysis involves using up a coenzyme, uh, NAD+, NAD, that would have been regenerated later in the process of cellular respiration. So if there isn't any oxygen, uh, the cell will perform fermentation to regenerate the NADH back into the NAD+. A byproduct of fermentation is lactic acid, and lactic acid requires oxygen to be broken down. This is one of the reasons that you continue to breathe really heavily even after you've stopped working out. Uh, your body to break down the lactic acid that built up in your cells during anaerobic respiration and fermentation. Now, if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you just yet, that's okay. Once you've gone through aerobic respiration, um, it will make a whole lot more sense because we're going to talk about NADH and NAD+, when we get into uh, cellular respiration. But basically, that molecule um, carries electrons. So if it doesn't have any electrons uh, attached to it, it's called NAD+. Once it attaches to some electrons, it converts to NADH. But like I said, we'll talk about that again uh, with cellular respiration. So just you might want to come back to this fermentation idea after you've had a chance to look at that. Your textbook discusses several diseases that are related to obesity, uh, including diabetes, hypertension, and heart attacks, as well as strokes. I do want to briefly focus on diabetes, because diabetes is an illness that affects both people and pets. Uh, so understanding how it works is very important. Uh, this is a very common disease. You're probably going to come across it um, at some point in your life. So uh, just to make it easier on you in the future, it's better to kind of understand it now. So diabetes involves your pancreas. Your pancreas is an organ uh, that sits near your stomach, and it has two primary jobs. It secretes digested enzymes into the small intestine, and it also secretes insulin into your bloodstream. Insulin's purpose in the body is to help cells take up circulating glucose, so glucose that's around in the bloodstream, um, so that they can convert that sugar, that glucose, into energy through cellular respiration. So in diabetes, something happens that will prevent the cells from taking up glucose. 
So all that sugar just continues to circulate in the blood. Um, bacteria love glucose, so diabetic patients, both animals and people, um, are very prone to infections, uh, among other things, such as cataracts from deposits in the lens of the eye. There are two different types of diabetes in people. Um, types are not really uh, identified quite the same uh, in animals, but they are kind of similar. So in type 1 diabetes, the pancreas no longer makes insulin at all. Uh, the cells that used to make it are just gone. And a lot of times that's because the body actually destroys those, kind of an autoimmune reaction. But for whatever reason, uh, the pancreas is no longer able to make insulin. In type 2 diabetes, either the pancreas makes less insulin than normal or the cells in the body are less responsive to it. So type 2 diabetes is most common in overweight people and in pets. Um, being overweight actually makes your cells less responsive to insulin. Uh, other things can do that as well. So if you have a lot of cortisol hormone in your blood, um, that can do it. So people that are under stress um, can have problems with their blood sugar as well. So depending on the type of diabetes, um, type 1, type 2, it can be managed uh, by weight loss, by diet changes, or possibly it may require insulin injections. So there are different ways to manage it, but it is kind of a lifelong disease. All right, so that's the end of this overview. Um, the next video is going to go into a more detailed look at cellular respiration, so definitely take a look at that, and then you'll be able to get a hold on that concept and kind of look at it in your textbook.